So I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, some of our findings from a, a few different climate manipulation experiments at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest that weren't set up to be able to compare to one another, but it just worked out that way that uh, it sort of created a nice opportunity to do that. Um, so I'm sure we're all really familiar with um, the forest carbon cycle and why, why we care about carbon. So I'll just provide a, a brief overview. So, so globally, forests and terrestrial ecosystems are really important in mitigating uh, climate change by removing large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In fact, those terrestrial ecosystems and largely forests are offsetting about a third of global uh, CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion. And uh, here and uh, throughout much of, of the northeastern U.S., our northern hardwood forests are currently a net carbon sink. So what a net carbon sink is, it really just boils down to the really small difference between the amount of carbon that gets removed by a forest from the, uh, from the atmosphere during photosynthesis, the difference between that and what gets released back into the atmosphere through uh, respiration. Um, and as I'm showing up here, you can see how small that difference is. This is an example from, from Harbor Brook. And soil respiration in particular is the second largest carbon flux in our forest ecosystems. About two thirds of all the carbon dioxide that leaves these ecosystems is from soil respiration. And we know that the processes that drive soil respiration are really sensitive to different aspects of climate. And so for those of you, I'm sure all of you now at, at this conference are from, or at least have spent a lot of time in the northeastern U.S., and you know that our climate historically has been quite variable, right? We, we've experienced different extreme events. So up here on the top left is the ice storm event of 1998. Uh, we periodically will get severe soil freezing events. This typically happens, especially in the northern parts of the region, when there's a mismatch between the timing of the development of the winter snowpack and when we get uh, cold air temperatures. And while overall our climate is getting wetter, there's a bit more variability in these precipitation patterns. And as I'll show you in a minute, it's not evenly distributed uh, throughout the year. And so we have maybe an increase in, in the, the frequency of, of water stress. And so at the top right here, it is an example of uh, what uh, a fall drought might do. And in this case, we're showing it in, in river flow. And on the bottom right here, uh, this is an image that my group took this year at Black Rock Forest in, in Lake uh, late September, where we had a flash drought event that lasted from uh, late August through late September, where there was almost no precipitation. And you can see um, at, on these ridge tops uh, and these drier hill slopes, those oak forests, the, the leaves started senescing about a month earlier than they did the, the prior year, right? So there's even these short term droughts can have really important implications on our forest ecosystems. And so moving forward, we know from the climate models that there's a variety of different things that, are, that, that might change, different aspects of our climate. Um, and a lot of this is being driven by changes in sort of our mean annual temperature. So under our high emission scenario, we can expect by the end of the century, much of our region will on average be about five degrees Celsius warmer than it is today. But that's not the only thing that's changing, right? So precipitation is changing. And as I mentioned a minute ago, it's not changing evenly throughout the year. We can expect our winters to become wetter and our uh, summers and falls to maybe not really see much of a change in precipitation at all. And so when you combine those things with changes in temperature, what that means is warmer, wetter winters maybe reduce the snowpack, as I'll show you uh, some, some data on that in, in a minute, um, and maybe it increases the frequency that we might might see ice storm events, which are really uh, difficult to predict and, and model, but the possibility is there. And if we get no change in precipitation, but we get warmer temperatures during the, the summer, that's going to increase evaporative demand, and that's going to increase uh, water stress for, for our ecosystems. In addition to sort of these mean changes, um, for, throughout much of the northeastern U.S., we're expected to see an increase in the interannual variability of water stress, right? So some years may be really wet, other years may be really dry. And uh, this is sort of uh, a big change, maybe, I mean, the climate here has always been variable, but it's just, just gonna become even more so moving forward. And it's not quite clear how our forests will respond to that. 
There we go. Um, and so as I mentioned, those warmer winters uh, that are wetter, maybe a reduced proportion of our precipitation coming as snow, some of our modeling work suggests that relative to the last half of the 20th century, we are expected to see large declines in sort of the depth and duration of winter snowpack. Here I'm showing it as um, uh, the uh, likelihood of there being an insulating snowpack during the winter. And you can see the big differences uh, in that likelihood. And essentially, we're stuck with sort of our higher elevation regions and in Maine where we're going to have that moving forward. And we know from experimental work and from observational work that reductions in snowpack can increase soil freezing, and that can adversely impact our ecosystems by damaging roots and, and all uh, a whole cascade of ecosystem responses resulting from that. Okay, so um, over the past five or six, or I guess seven years now, there's been a few different climate manipulation experiments that have been set up at uh, Harvard Brook Experimental Forest. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on these. There's been these ice storm experiments, and there's been uh, the climate change across seasons experiment and the drought net experiment. Um, and so what I'm gonna do here is show you a little bit of data on how these different aspects of climate change might uh, impact soil respiration, and then end sort of showing you how these different aspects of climate change sort of compare to one another. So the climate change across seasons experiment is a multi-factorial multi -factorial experiment that's exploring the interactive eff effects of warmer growing season temperatures and an increase in the likelihood of soil freeze thaw cycles during the winter. And so we have six plots that are 11 meters by 14 meters and we have two replicates in each of our treatments. Um, we use uh, these heating cables that we bury in the, in the soil uh, to warm the soil temperatures. And when we go out there with a thermal infrared camera, you can actually see the stripes where we have those cables about 10 centimeters in the ground. And then uh, here's just an example of what some of those data look like. The green and the yellow, those are our plots that are warm during the growing season. You can see the difference with our reference plots. And then the green plots here, those are the plots that also receive freeze thaw cycles during the winter. So you can see we were successfully able to do that. This is just two years of data, but this is sort of the pattern that we see every year. When we look at how, this, uh, how soil respiration responds to this, we, we find some pretty interesting results. First, um, so I guess I should mention for this slide and the next few slides, I'm showing changes in respiration uh, as a percent difference from what we observe in a particular year for the, the reference plots. And so what we find is that shortly after we flip on the warming cables, we get an increase in soil respiration, about 35 or 40% increase. But what was really interesting is when we have warming, but we also have these free thaw cycles, and we take into account that aspect of winter climate change as well, we find that while there's an initial increase in soil respiration, that all goes away after a few years. And so it seems that the free thaw cycles that we might see an increase in number moving forward will offset any enhancement of soil respiration that will happen from warming during the growing season. And also this work, which has now been going on since uh, 2013, 2014, and will be hopefully for as long in the future as we can secure funding, it really highlights the importance of having these long-term manipulations. Because if we had just stopped after a couple of years, um, we would have uh, sort of concluded something different than we would have been able to go out four, five, or six years. So one of the other experiments that we've done is to sort of try and, and see how the forest will respond to different levels of water stress and drought severity. And so this is our, our drought net experiment. We have six plots that are each 15 by 15 meters and sort of three different treatments. We have our reference. Uh, we have plots where we exclude 50% of through fall. Those ran uh, from 2014 to 2018. And then just this year in 2019, we uh, ratcheted it up a notch and we are excluding now 90% of, of through fall precipitation. And we do this using these series of, of troughs. And so what we find here is that um, relative to our, our reference plots, in this period of time when we're only removing half of the, the through fall, we get a small decline in, in uh, rates of respiration. It's not significant every year. It's pretty variable. Um, 
But as soon as we increase our uh, precipitation exclusion to 90%, we see huge reductions, nearly 50% reductions in rates of soil respiration. And I should point out that we observe this change even within just a few weeks of increasing the amount of through fall that we were eliminating from the plot. And then the other experiment that's going on is this really cool uh, ice storm experiment that was designed to sort of mimic the ice storm of, of 98. Um, and so there's, there's 10 different plots that are 20 by 30 meters in size. There's five treatments. There's our, our reference plot. There's six millimeters of ice accretion, 12 millimeters, 19 millimeters. And then there's uh, another set of plots where there was 12 millimeters of ice accretion in two consecutive years. The other treatments, it was just sort of a, a one ice storm event. Um, and it makes for really cool photos. So basically what they did is they went out on a really cold night in winter with a fire hose and just shot it above the canopy and they were actually able to do a really good job of meeting these target rates of, of ice accretion. And so we had expected to find really big changes in respiration in response to these treatments, but that's not really what we found. Um, in our low accretion treatment, we see a little bit of an increase in respiration. So this is, you know, the scale here is different than in the uh, other treatments. So, you know, 5 to 10% increase in, in respiration. Um, it's likely that there was enough small debris that was produced during this, ice, this simulated ice storm that that stimulated rates of decomposition. But we expected to see much bigger responses and much bigger increases in respiration following our higher accretion treatments. But if anything, we found the opposite, where there were uh, declines in, in rates of respiration. And I'm not going to go into the potential mechanisms too much here, but probably what's happening is some of the larger debris that's falling is not actually making it to the soil, where we measure rates of soil respiration. It's getting hung up on other coarse woody debris, and so we're just not capturing those decomposition dynamics. The other piece is that when, when the canopy is losing a high proportion of its biomass, it's likely impacting um, root biomass and rates of root respiration. So these declines could be mediated by, by uh, declines in below ground carbon allocation. Okay, so now what do all of these uh, treatments look like when we compare them to one another? So I have this really noisy figure here, but the, the big take home messages are, so here this is uh, four years of data across all of these different experiments, um, and they all mostly sit on top of one another with some exceptions. So the warming plots in the red, you can see consistently have much higher rates of respiration than all the other plots. The other one that sticks out is in uh, our 2019 ratcheting up of through fall exclusion. Um, that drought experiment, we see large reductions in rates of, of soil respiration. And when I distill this down into a little bit more of a, of a simple figure that gives you an idea of just total changes in loss throughout the growing season, uh, what we find uh, when we look at our uh, climate change across seasons experiment, of course, the biggest impact there is from warming alone. Uh, in our drought net experiment, the biggest impact is when we uh, really increase, so we sort of push the limits of the system and remove almost all of the precipitation. And then for our ice storm experiment, there's really not much of a, a change yet, at least in the way that we've been measuring it. Um, and so what we're finding from these experiments, this all suggests that um, Perhaps warming and drought are likely to have the biggest impacts on this important uh, forest carbon flux. Um, and the extent to which these interact with one another, we don't know. But probably, uh, ultimately, drought wins, wins out because without water, the microbes can't decompose things. The roots uh, and the trees will start to shut down a little bit. Um, but perhaps this is a place for future research. And this was, uh, these three experiments were huge projects with lots of people, so I need to make sure I acknowledge all of them and, and the variety of different funding sources.
Um, I wish that I could. So, so for what, what we want to do next is start to get at some of those mechanisms. What I suspect is happening from a lot of our previous work, we find that the, the freezing, it increases root mortality. Um, and, and initially, there's probably an increase in respiration because there's increased substrate there for the microbes that decompose. But if over time, it's actually resulting in either a reduction in root biomass or changes in below ground carbon allocation patterns, then that could, by virtue of reducing the root respiration component, uh, could uh, be the reason that all the warming-induced increases in soil restoration are being offset when we introduce the freeze-thaw cycles. Um, I don't know for certain if that's the answer. The other thing I can add is that we also see the same exact pattern when we look at rates of above-ground growth. Um, so all the, uh, we see a stimulation of tree growth with just warming. All of that, or most of that, gets lost when we introduce the free thaw cycle. So we're also seeing um, offsets in, in total forest productivity. So stay, stay tuned. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll have a really big grant, and we can dig into that a little bit deeper. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in, in this experiment and more so in previous experiments where we focus more explicitly on that, we find that uh, you induce soil freezing, you get an increased loss uh, largely of, of nitrate, um, and that is directly linked to declines in, in live root biomass and reduced capacity for the trees to take that up. So yeah, we see, we see those same things here as well. Uh, no, we haven't started looking at soil carbon pools. It's a, it's a tricky thing because the pools, the size is really large, and so trying to detect changes in that pool over the course of years is really, really difficult, especially when there's so much spatial heterogeneity in that pool. We could start to do things and, and look at maybe changes in that labile pool. So some of the soil warming work at Harvard Forest that was done by Jerry Malolo's group, um, they found that there's sort of uh, this initial increase in respiration associated with warming is because the microbes have just sort of accelerated decomposition of that labile material. So we can explore maybe those sorts of things. But to look at the entire soil carbon pool, I think any change that could have happened is going to be small relative to the size of the pool and the amount of spatial heterogeneity. But that's a, that's a great thought. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, so especially for the 90% the removal, we've been thinking a lot about, okay, well, what do we do with this leaf litter to make sure that we're not also doing a leaf litter removal experiment? Um, and so that sort of gets uh, sprinkled on, or at least that's, that's, the, that's the idea. <laughs>